So I will use R and T to zoom or command brackets to zoom. And I might be like, all right, I really want to start playback like right around here where this clip ends. I might click over here somewhere and then just do option tab to really quickly bring myself to the end of that clip. And so I can either start playback there or I can zoom way in if I wanted to work with something here. So I often use that to kind of more precisely target where I want to be in the session. So like option tab to go to the back and zoom in or tab to go to the front and zoom in on a clip. So it's a really helpful way to navigate your session using tab. And then basically with the tab to transients option, which is when this is on here, this button with a little tab symbol, and then it's like a little waveform symbol here. What it's gonna do is it's gonna go to the transient point. So wherever a sound picks up really quickly. So if I hit tab, instead of traveling to the next break point, it's gonna go to the transient point, which is where the sound picks up here. I'm like pointing on my screen, like you didn't see my screen or see me pointing at the screen. So anyway, I can move around that way in my session. This one I don't use as often, but it can help you find, for example, the very beginning of a sound to then align it up with something, which can be very helpful at points. So I'm just gonna return this to normal tab because I use that more often. And that is using tab in Pro Tools. So another one that I find very, very helpful in Pro Tools is the idea of using option to return things to, to zero or return things to normal. So for example, if I bring down this volume fader and I wanna bring it to exactly zero, I can just hold option or all if you're on Windows and just click on it and it brings that to zero. Same thing with things like pan knobs. If I wanna bring that to zero, Option click brings it to zero. So it's super quick, super easy, great way to normalize things again if you're trying to do that. And it works in a range of different applications. It also works sometimes to remove things if like the default is for the thing not to be there. So for example, with this marker, if I hold option and click on it, it'll delete it for me. So option and Pro Tools, super helpful to understand the range of ways that it can be used. To summarize the quick shortcuts that are buried in the keyboard, I can do comma and period to nudge things backwards and forwards. I can do P and semicolon to move my highlight up and down. P is up, semicolon is down. I can do D, F, and G to do quick fades. I can do A and then S to do quick trims from the beginning or the end. And I can do R and T to zoom. Finally, we have the cache size. And there's only one reason why I tend to change this. And that is if you get that horrible, garbled, distorted sound. Um, it basically sounds like you hit play and everything seems like it's running smoothly. But when you're listening, it sounds really, really distorted and garbled and awful. Um, and anyone who's run a Pro Tools session, like a big Pro Tools session on a laptop would probably be really familiar with this. Um, I, what I did for a long time is I would just have to restart, I think, all of Pro Tools. Um, to fix the garble, right? Because it's, you know, you'd, you'd hit pause and sit for a second and usually it would still be there. Um, occasionally it won't be, but usually it will. So I would always just restart Pro Tools to fix it. But what I figured out at some point, um, like a few years back, I think, is that if you go to this cache size and you change it to anything, so right now it's on 44, you just change it to whatever, just change it to something different and then hit okay, that'll fix the garble and you don't have to restart your whole session. So if I record enable this track. I'm going to leave it unmuted so I can hear it. Um, now, now you can, can hear, hear me with, with a delay. delay. Ooh, I hate it. I can't handle it. Okay, so we have that going. If we then go and turn on low latency monitoring, I have it set right now so that when I turn this on, you see the signal, but you're not going to hear it. So I don't have to worry about that delay, that, um, that latency, right? That echo. So when you have this on, sometimes you have the setting on and you like this setting and you prefer it this way so you don't have to hear that echo or, or what have you, right? So sometimes you'll have the setting on, but it would just be a little bit better if you could also have the send to the reverb active, right? Because then, for example, the singer might wanna hear a little bit of reverb while they perform, it helps them improve their performance. And so what you can do is you can go to setup and then preferences here. And then what you wanna do is go to the mixing tab and it's somewhere in here, let me find it. Yeah, so it's right here. Allow sends to persist during LLM with this one session that I had that I opened the night before the client was coming in to work on it my session was not opening at all. So I couldn't even avoid the plugin or avoid changing parameters on the plugin to avoid a crash. I had to actually address the issue. So the thing you can do is 
once Pro Tools is, you'll notice that Pro Tools is running here for me. So once Pro Tools is running, you can hold shift and then click on your PTX file, or you can do this from the open dialog page, right? And you'll notice that I am holding shift this whole time as I'm talking the whole time it's opening, I'm holding shift. And so what that does is you'll notice here, it says plugin inactive. I had a plugin open last time I saved. And you'll notice that every single plugin in my session is now inactive. Every single one, this is actually a hardware insert. It's not a plugin insert. So um, every single plugin is now inactive. And what I can do is I can very carefully make my plugins active again and see when the problem arises, where the problem arises. So the clip effect feature in Pro Tools. It's actually been out for a good amount of time. I think it's been about eight years that it's been out now. So we have had it out for a while. Nowadays, it's actually down here. You can open and close it right here using this little tab here at the bottom of your edit window. It used to be, I believe it would pop up up at the top here. So if you ever saw that, this type of window up towards the top of Pro Tools, that's probably what you were looking at. And you know, the advantage of using the clip effects section, one of the big advantages that I found is that it's low latency and it doesn't use a lot of processing power. So that's an advantage there. You can also render the audio files out. So I'll show you that in a little bit here. And you know, again, according to Avid, when this first came out and they announced it, you know, they said it's not an audio suite process like your audio suite plugins. It's not a real time process like your inserts. It is its own process and it's on the clip level. And then the other thing you can do, right, is if you want to save some processing power, you can render it out. You don't have to render it. I don't I don't do this. I don't render to, to clips very often, um, but it's something you can do. And then you can also one thing that I really like is you can copy and then you can paste. So let me actually, let me go to this one because it's different from the others. And I'm gonna go clip effects, I'm gonna copy, and then I'm gonna go to this one. I'm gonna go paste clip effects right here. I just right clicked and now I've pasted that clip effect. So you can get it settled on one clip and then you can be like, okay, I want that on all these clips and just highlight, right? So you can go paste clip effects and now it's on all of them. So you can copy paste, you can clear, you can work on individual clips, you can work on multiple clips at once. There's a lot you can do here. So it says nudge right here. And this is the little icon for one measure. And if I click here, I can actually change the unit of measurement and then also what the actual value is. So if I want, one thing that I do a lot is I'll nudge things by 0 0.001. Um, so one millisecond, right? So it's the, the smallest unit of time that you can do when it's in minutes and seconds. And the reason why I do that, I'll zoom in so we can kind of see it happening. So I'm gonna hit comma and move it forward and then period to move it back. And I actually had a video about this. I think it was my beat making tips video where I talked about this and I'll do this a lot with samples. So for example, snare samples, I'll try moving it forward by a few milliseconds and then backwards by a few milliseconds. So it's slightly off the beat and that um, helps change the feel of the song, right? So sometimes we'll do that in a chorus, we'll move it forward to make it feel more forward and like things are moving along differently. Now, the next one I wanna show you is another one that I have shared before on this channel and I use this one a lot. And it's the idea that if you highlight a range of time and then you use either the semicolon to go down or the P on the keyboard to go up. And again, this is in your main keyboard. It'll move your highlight by a track each time you hit it and it'll retain your highlight. So I'll use this a lot. Like for example, if I have, this track is inactive, but if I have automation on one track that I then want to duplicate down to another track, I can highlight it, do command C, and then do semicolon to go down. And I'll go past the track and then back up to just get that automation graph and not also highlight the whole track with the actual audio on it. Um, and then I'll do command V to paste. And there we go. And so usually when I'm copying something, there isn't this big difference here when I paste it in because it's probably a track that has some similar stuff going on. But if I wanted to have the same kind of increase without this change here, I could then use my trim tool and bring it up and kind of match the level there. All right, so first of all, automation in Pro Tools is just when you're changing a parameter over time. It can be any parameter, right? You're just making changes to that parameter over time. So when we look at automation in Pro Tools, it's on what's called an automation graph. So this line here is an example of an automation graph. This line is an example of an automation graph. See how this one is changing over time? That's automation. Um, this little like Mm, it's not quite grayed out, but the thinner, the fainter line here is because this track is inactive. But um, with automation in Pro Tools, you know, we can 
add dots and change things over time. So this is my volume automation. You can see that here. And I'm just holding command and then clicking to add those dots. And then I can change things over time. And the way touch works is it waits for you to touch the parameter, whatever it is. And then it'll write that for the duration of you touching it. So let me just hit play and show you. So it's not writing automation right now. See how it, there's nothing changing here? When I click on this and start moving it, now it's writing the automation. You can see that it's doing that because it turns red. And when I release this, what's going to happen is it's going to go back to where the automation was previously. So I'll release, and it jumps right back up to this location here. Um, same idea if I switch over and I move things here, or if I move the panning, and we can now see that here. So that's how touch works. It waits for you to touch the parameter and then it automates it while you're moving it. Now, another one that you can use is you can use option and then control, hold those down and then use the up and down arrows to adjust the height of all your tracks, right? So notice how it's changing the height of all of my tracks. So for example, if I wanna see all of my tracks all at once, I can hit the down arrow until I see them all at once. And that's, you know, as long as you don't have so many tracks that it's not possible, right? Um, but this is really handy for quickly adjusting track height. I don't use this as much as some of the other ones on this list because I like to have, for example, my aux tracks a little bit bigger and then I'll often like make the individual audio tracks really small, that type of thing. But it is a helpful shortcut to know. So this is a shortcut I use super frequently within sessions and that's to turn the click track on or off. So I have the click track ready to go and active. You do need to have it within the session here, but once you have it within your session, you can just hit seven on the numeric keypad and your click will come back into play. So that's one way to really quickly bypass the click and that's gonna work for everyone. So I always, I don't always do it this way, right? Sometimes I'll do it this way. It depends on what I'm doing. When I'm like beat making, for example, I'll use that seven on the numeric keypad to toggle the click on and off because it's faster. But if I have someone that's tracking, for example, a lot of times I will leave it active so that they still get it in their headphones through my send. And then I'll just mute it for me if I don't wanna hear it. Now, if I switch to my mix window and I do command option M, this will make, it'll toggle my tracks between either like the wide view or the narrow view. So this can help you view more tracks at once within your mix window, especially if you're getting into a very, very big session. So again, that's command option M which I believe if it's a Windows machine would be control alt M. If you add shift to that, so you do command shift and then up and down, you can add a second option here. So I just created a stereo master fader with my first one. So maybe the next one is to create a bunch of mono audio tracks, right? So I might hit the number five to create five at once. And I can just do this without having to move my mouse around. So it's much faster this way, right? So command shift and then down to add another type, right? Maybe I wanna create a stereo instrument for this, whatever I'm working on, right? And if you wanna remove one, you can just do the up arrow to remove them again. So Again, holding command shift, up and down arrow to add things. And then once you're all ready, you just hit enter and it'll create the tracks that you want. So I'm just gonna hit enter, I guess here. Not that I need these tracks and see how it made those tracks for me. Okay. 